Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities across Canada. Today, we are delving into the heart of Diamond Valley, Alberta, a community that has witnessed a transformative year since the historic amalgamation of Turner Valley and Black Diamond. With me, we have two distinguished guests who have played pivotal roles in shaping the destiny of this amalgamated city. Joining us for this significant discussion, we have Diamond Valley Mayor Barry Crane, who steered the ship of Turner Valley through the amalgamation process, and Diamond Valley Deputy Mayor Brendan Kelly, who led the charge of progress in Black Diamond prior to amalgamation. Now, last November, we sat down with these two gentlemen regarding the lead up to the amalgamation process. One year later, here we are. And he, we are here to reflect on the journey, the trials and the triumphs, and the collaborative efforts that have defined the very essence that is Diamond Valley. From the very first election to the intricate negotiations that have brought these communities together, it has been a year of unprecedented change for the newest community within Alberta. Now, we will uncover the challenges that have tested the metal of this united community, from the integration of services to the preservation of unique identities. But most importantly, we will celebrate the remarkable achievements and milestones that have cemented Diamond Valley's place on the map. So let's take a moment to honor the spirit of togetherness and progress as we embark on an insightful journey through the prism of Diamond Valley's remarkable transformation. Stay with us as we explore the amalgamation impact on local businesses, infrastructure development, and the future directory of this newest community. This is Municipal Affairs. Mayor Crane, Deputy Mayor Kelly, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Sit down and talk to me. Uh, I want to start with, uh, it's been one year. One year since the three of us sat down. Last time we sat down with my friend and your friend as well, Ian McCormick. He's unfortunately away, uh, flying back from Eastern Canada to uh, Alberta. So I want to start with sort of a general question, and it's an important question. We are one year into Diamond Valley, and I want to start with Mayor, uh, uh, Mayor Crane, if possible. How's it been? How has Diamond Valley's birth come about? Well, you know what? It's been an interesting run for sure, uh, but it's been an exciting one. Um, right on, hot on the heels of the election last October, I think we had it. Um, we had two months then of the blended councils leading up to January 1. We had an amazing inauguration ceremony. We had uh, then past Minister uh, MacIver of Municipal Affairs, who was wrapping up his career, essentially at the time he was demoted and he thought he was out to pasture. Um, so he showed up and we had RJ Sigurdsson there, who's now Minister of uh, Agriculture and Irrigation. Uh, so it was a great ceremony uh, held at the Legion. Uh, big kudos to Rick at the time, thinking it was his last kick. Of course, he came back like a, a phoenix and here he is again. But um, it was it was really good. We had a nice blended council, uh, three Black Diamond, three Turner Valleys, if you want to do the split. And I was kind of the, the mayor in the middle. Um, and of course, I've always looked at us all as one. So it worked out well that way. Um, lots of struggles through uh, the first few meetings. Just so large agendas. Uh, we never got past a five or a six hour meeting for easily six months uh, which was frustrating to the black diamond council because brendan runs an extremely efficient meeting as past mayor he was like okay barry wrap it up let's go let's go let's go uh but it was just so much content we had to uh we had to put it in put in the time um lots of extra meetings and uh of course a lot of change over in staff uh during that first little uh trial and period had to go on to search for a new CAO within, I don't know, how long was that, Brendan? A couple of months? A couple of months, yeah. Yeah, a couple of months. So so there was a lot of change happening really fast. Um, but we took it all in stride, and uh, we're looking for another CAO now. Uh, but that's because that's all part of the plan. Uh, so right now we're actively seeking the CAO of the future. That we want this solidly one that's there for five to ten years and really has the longevity to outlast councils and be that common denominator for growth. So, but uh, in a nutshell, it's ongoing. We're not even close to done yet. So there you go. There's one year. 
thank you so much for that, uh, Mayor. Uh, I want to start, though, because we've got an encompass of the new mayor of uh, Turner Valley, uh, Diamond Valley, sorry, talking about the community in the year after. But I want to go back to that election. And I want to start there because I think we need to do sort of a a year in review. Uh, And I want to start with this with the new deputy mayor, but then Black Diamond Mayor Brendan Kelly. You made the decision to run for council and not run for mayor. Was there a decision or was there a conversation between the two of you looking back on it a year ago and saying it would be better for both of us to be there than just one of us be at the mayor's chair? How did the decision come about for Barry to run for mayor and yourself to run for councillor? Or was it just luck of the draw? Yeah, so, you know, it's uh, it. It's a tough thing, not a tough, well, it was a, it was a really tough decision uh, personally to have to make. It wasn't an easy decision, one that I, that I took lightly. I took a lot of pride um, in, in getting elected initially as the Black Diamond Mayor. However, I knew at that time that it was likely to be a short-lived stint. Um, and as we were coming on off the heels of COVID uh, with the by-election kind of looming, if amalgamation was going to go ahead, I knew that there would be an opportunity to do the year, year and a half uh, as mayor. Um, in a sense, you know, you kind of get your feet wet. So uh, that summer, last summer, um, after we had passed um, uh, the application and Minister McIver had signed off on it and everything, I really had to start thinking about what I wanted to do and what was the best choice for the community, uh, first and foremost, and obviously my family. <clears throat> um those are really the two big pieces that I had to consider and the conversations that I had with my wife. Um, I wasn't entirely sure if I was going to be able to give the newly amalgamated town of Diamond Valley the same um, amount of energy and uh, contribute as much. I was unaware at that time what 5,400 people would bring to the table versus 2,700. And so that was a big part of the decision. And once I had thrown this back and forth with my wife a bit and the Obviously, with the time commitment, I have two kids. My daughter's seven and my son's four. And, you know, I looked across the river at Barry and uh, his his family is a little bit older than mine. His kids are teenagers. They're a little bit more established in the community. And so I knew that it was more of a, you know, daughter's got to go to basketball. Son's got to go to volleyball or whatnot. That's in in some respects. and, And I hope Mayor Crane doesn't take this wrong way, but there's, there's more opportunities to just drop somebody off in that respect. Like, you know, Oh, Hey, you know, my son's got to be over here. My daughter's volunteering over there. I boom, boom. I'm moving with my kids. I had to be a lot. I have to be a lot more present. You know, if they're going to dance or if they're going to music, I'm typically there the whole time. And so, you know, kind of throwing a lot of those things around, I started to have a conversation with Mayor Crane and said, look, I want to stay involved. Um, I know that both communities are really excited for us to, to do the Hatfield and McCoys yeah. at the election yeah. and, and really take this thing up. And, uh, but as we, as we discussed it, it didn't make a lot of sense for one of us to disappear. And that's, that's what would have happened. Um, had Barry ran and, or had we both run for mayor and, and Barry got in and I was out black diamond potentially loses a voice. The other, the other side of it is Turner Valley loses not only a voice, but someone that's been in council um, for, more than a decade now, I think, Mayor Crane. Yeah, so, yeah, and and I, you know, prior to running for mayor, I I looked up to Barry a lot, um, not only as, a, like, we started working at the school here. He was working at the school when I started here, and um, there was a great amount of respect for Barry, and when, we, when I told him I was going to run for mayor in Black Diamond, oh, yeah, that's great, you know, you ever need anything? So I knew that if I took a, if I took a step back, um, ran for council. I could still stay involved. I'd still have that mentorship. I could learn a lot more uh, as well being a counselor. And you, I've, I've actually found it to be really rewarding because I'm not chair. Uh, I, I said this after my first couple meetings to my wife, Carly, I said, man, I can, I can kind of pick issues now and kind of look at those directly versus just having to be the voice for council, right? Like you, you always have to be the, the major the speaker for the majority in council so it's very hard to take a direction on rv parking or anything else like that and say hey no this is really silly you know or this yeah no this is a really good idea as mayor you have to accept a lot of that responsibility and 
I, there are a lot of times uh, where I had to say things as a mayor that I spoke against in the chambers, but then had to say, hey, this is the will of council. This is what the majority of council wants. So there's been a lot of rewards uh, alongside becoming councillor. And, um, you know, there's certain, you get stopped a lot and, and there's, there's certainly a great hope that the future might bring me back to that chair. Um, and those will be discussions that we'll have, you know, in the next year and a half, two years before we come up to the next election. Um, so, yeah, that, uh, that conversation, Mayor Crane and I had quite a bit. And uh, I, I think for the greater good of the community, it was, it was, you know, to be honest and to be transparent, it was a tough pill to swallow. Um, but it was something that once I made the decision, I was like, this is my decision. I'm not going to regret it. I'm still going to be the voice for the community whenever I can. And I, a uh, proud member of the council, took home quite a few votes and was um, uh, yeah. um, uh, chosen to be the deputy. And that's not a hat that I wear lightly. And I still, I'm still very honored and, and happy to be in the in the chair alongside Barry and my other fellow, fellow council members. I want to take a, talk about the makeup of the council here for a second because I think this is an important factor that I think needs to be discussed a little bit further. This election came down to three former Black Diamond councillors, or three uh, three former Black Di Diamond council members, and three former Turner Valley council members, and then you, Barry as the mayor of the new Diamond Valley. Do you think that has benefited you over the last year? And this is to both of you, because you both represent two sides of the river in this case, that yeah. you have an equal amount of voices on this council who both <coughs> represents the old town of Diamond Valley and the old town of Turner Valley, uh, Black Diamond and Turner Valley. There's too many names here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just right <laughs> off the bat there. Do you, do you think it been, has benefited you over the last year where this council is made up of tr truly a split of both communities and not just one lopsided compared to another? On Grabber, uh, I think 100%. Um, you know, we had the option when we were doing the original application to break out into wards. Uh, we could have done that, which would have seen exactly what happened uh, be written into law. But it's it's better that it worked out that we had three and a three and me at large, as it were, uh, because now people do feel that they have equal representation, even though it's the first year of amalgamation. Next year, uh, or in a year and a half, it could be six, six uh, Black Diamond residents, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it is very hard still to, to say Diamond Valley on a continuous basis. It's Black Diamond, is Turner Valley. Yeah, and that's Diamond Valley over the top, right? Uh, so we're looking at it as Bow Ness, Forest Lawn, Malin Heights, you know, in Calgary. Uh, we're trying to get to that. Some people have gone to Diamond Valley East, Diamond Valley West. But, um, but the representation, I think, has been so well, uh, well evenly split that everyone whether you were for or against it, at least you feel represented and you can just easily take a couple of blocks and you'll find that councillor lives very close by. So I, I think it's been a, a definite blessing on the first year of amalgamation to have such a blended council. Not only that, everyone was um, previously a councillor to that. So everyone came in with experience. Everyone came in with knowledge of the background, of why we we're going this route and the overall direction that we actually want to set um, and, and budget experience along with it. So everyone came in fully geared to hit the ground running and really put in the work. And, and we've definitely had to do that. So yeah, that's my take. Right? Yeah. And if, if I could, yeah, I'll interject just quickly because I think that that's an important distinction there is that um, not only did everyone come with experience, but uh, both of our pr uh, previous deputy mayors were also reelected. Um, so you have that leadership, that strength, the trust that's already there. Uh, Councillor Kloiber and Councillor uh, Holloway. Um, yeah, we're, we're both uh, Mayor Crane and, and mine's, uh, my uh, deputies. And, you know, you, you, you have to, I'm try, I don't want to sound over, overly critical here, but for a new councillor to have walked in to an amalgamation process, having not been a part of council, W would have been completely overwhelming. Um, I don't, I can't, I can't say that, you know, wrong decisions or wrong information would have been made, but
but having that continuity after going through a by-election where we had just had an election, that that made things, you know, you kind of get off the tracks a little bit about what the focus is here. Hey, we're talking about amalgamation. Now we got to spend two months going back to the polls. We got to get the public back engaged. We had, I think, like 12 or 13 people running, um, which really kind of convoluted everything. So we're, we're trying to do our job over here, focus on amalgamation, keep the ship going the right way. But then you're getting pulled. I got to do I got to do door to door. I'm doing the you know, we're up doing the the speeches and all that stuff. You bring some new counselors into the fold of that. And it, it can, you know, for one of the least experienced counselors at that time, uh, completely overwhelming. So uh, it's, it's there's no I'm not throwing shade at any of those counselors that that were in the running. But I when I read that application just for amalgamation, it was over 500 pages. And then all the supporting documents behind that. It, it would have been a mountain of work for a new counselor. So having having incumbents on both sides, the equal number was just a you know blessing more or less. Like we couldn't have predicted that, um, but it all worked out. We are one year in, and I, I went back and I listened to our previous interview from a year ago this month, actually in November, and I, I was listening to what some of the expectations that you guys were looking forward to one year in, and this is where this conversation kind of came out uh, of do, doing a follow up a year later, and I want to talk about the legislative side because. Bringing uh, two people together is a unique beast. When two, when a couple moves in together, you have to weed out the the things that you don't want anymore. Maybe that couch that's old and outdated needs to get going. But when you talk about legislative aspects of two communities coming together and becoming one community, this is a whole unique beast because each of your separate parts of your now community have their own unique identities. But now you have to make that identity one. So I want to start with Deputy Mayor Kelly here, if that's okay, because I want to talk about one particular issue, and that is RVs. Now, Mm -hmm. Black Diamond at the time didn't allow, if I'm not mistaken, RVs in parking lot, on your your driveway. But in Turner Valley, they were allowed. Uh, Now, this is probably one of these issues that is probably just something that no one really thinks about that often. But for you as counsel, you have to debate it. You have to engage with people. Was it hard to amalgamate the, and I'm assuming it's still going on, the legislative side of this uh, union? Yeah, and and this is probably something that we could spend a couple hours on on its own. And, and I'm happy that you bring up a very specific example because this one uh, really came to my attention because the bylaw, the new RV bylaw, had just been passed a few months before the election that we had when I got voted in as mayor. And it was really contentious in the community. And 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 rightfully so. Um, there are certain parts of uh, the old Black Diamond, um, Riverwood, Willow Ridge. They're kind of on the south end of town. And part of their building code, and maybe that's the wrong terminology, but part, when those houses were built, there were stipulations built in because a lot of them don't have back alley access. They don't have rear parking Um, They don't have side house parking. And so what happened is there were some complaints from some people in the community that, oh, well, if we're not allowed to park our RVs here, nobody in Black Diamond should be allowed to park their RVs. So that snowballed. Um, And it was really kind of behind the scenes in the public eye. And it wasn't until really the bylaw had passed. And then all of a sudden the peace officers out and not, not handing out tickets. It was very educational for the first year. Um, you know, we had people that had campers in their backyard that had grown into their backyard, if you will. Right. And this is part of the, you know, over by the high school or behind AG foods and those types of areas, those lots are completely different. I, I live in Riverwood. So when I bought my house, I understood that I can't park my camper in my driveway. Um, the peace officers did a great job at the time, educational. There were a couple months before, uh, this was to be, um, uh, instituted. And so they went around, told people what to do. There was a little bit of flexibility in the terminology. You know, the peace officer kind of looked at it one way and, you know, the letter of the law was a little bit different and that was okay. I think that a lot of people looked at that, um, uh, with some flexibility. So fast forward a year and we, um, coming through like, you know, bylaw amalgamation as well, all of a sudden Turner Valley's on the hot seat because as part of the, um, 
the review, it's like, well, what council, what are we going to do? Are we extending this new bylaw that Black Diamond had just passed, you know, 18 months ago? Are we going to extend this blanket over to Turner Valley? And so we, at, we asked for public engagement, survey went out, and I think I'm pretty close. I think it was about 74% of the residents that replied wanted those RVs left on their properties. And we heard that loud and clear. We were presented the information. We looked at the uh, we looked at the survey that was done, and we said, "Let's go back. Let's let's go back to what we used to have." And it was just a couple weeks ago, Mary Crane, maybe mm-hmm. a month ago, where so now the old the older part of Black Diamond, they're permitted to have them in their side yard, and if they have the room on their driveway, that that's changed. So um, you know, that's just an example of you know obviously council listening. Black Diamond Council had been well aware of the problem since I was elected as mayor. And it was something that was in our in our uh, purview, but we didn't want to do any bylaw reviews before amalgamation because we knew after amalgamation, we'd be looking at this stuff anyways. So we left all those things kind of hanging and here we are. So before I jump in with uh, Mayor Crane here, I want to just follow up on that because this is an interesting case study because you you come from a community that passes a bylaw that doesn't allow for RVs to be parked on uh, driveways, but you're now in a community that allows them. And you have to leave your bias of what you brought to the table as a former Black Diamond mayor and be just a Turner uh, Diamond Valley deputy mayor. I can imagine, do you still have some unconscious bias saying, I, I'm always looking out for the betterment of Black Diamond because that's what I was elected to in the last election, but now I'm a Diamond Valley councillor, deputy mayor. So mm-hmm. when you go through this legislative process where you're merging these uh, 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 sort of bylaws, are you looking at it as a Black Diamond or are you looking at it as a Diamond Valley councillor? Um, and that, that question is going to you too, Mayor. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that as a resident of the, uh, the old, the former Black Diamond, um, you know, my heart and my key interests uh, immediately are triggered there first. But as I allow myself to get more involved with the, the Turner Valley side, which has been, an, which has been a great pleasure, um, getting out into that, like during, especially during the election, I did a lot of, a lot of boot stomping, a lot of door knocking during that election to get to know the Turner Valley residents because a lot of them didn't know who I was, even though I was just on the other side. Um, so, I mean, certainly those biases exist, but at the end of the day, Chris, to be honest with you, it really just comes back to the data. I mean, if, if you're sending out a survey and the residents are, you know, if it's like a 51, 49 split, okay, maybe we're going to have a little bit of a conversation here, but when you're getting, four or five, 600 responses to something such as the RV parking and 74% of the residents that have replied say, you know, we got to get back to the way that it was. I, in that case, my bias doesn't really exist. And, and again, for me, the kind of unique feature of that is it doesn't, it doesn't impact me anyways as a resident because I can't park my, I can't park my camper in my driveway anyways. So in that, in this specific case, I just wanted to listen to the people and I knew when I, when I got elected as mayor, one of the biggest things other than snow removal uh, was RV parking. What That was what people were kind of still distraught about. Geez, you know, I bought this big, I bought this big lot and I had it in the back and now I can't park it here. Okay. I hear you hang on for a year because as we get through amalgamation, this is going to be a bylaw review and we'll take a good hard look at it. We'll do another survey. So we had our peace officer team do a survey, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago and so, yeah, those biases exist, but in case, in some cases like this, I can kind of just put that aside and say, here's the data, what's the best thing to do for the community? Do you feel more added pressure on yourself, Mayor Crane, as the head of this council, this newly amalgamated community, to make sure that your bias doesn't show when you're making decisions around the council table when it comes to legislative uh, issues, whether it be the RV issue, whether it be a land use bylaw issue, whether it be planning, zoning, uh, so on and so forth, to make sure that you 
check your bias and say, okay, yes, I did uh, Mm -hmm. represent Turner Valley, but now I represent Diamond Valley. And people are looking to me, if we wanted a true united community, they're going to be looking to me to make sure that I'm not saying Turner Valley, Black Diamond, when I'm talking about issues of the past. Yeah, no, and the bias thing is real. And it was actually mentioned uh, the other night we were at a meeting um, you know, and while, while Brendan was nailing on those points, you know, I made a few notes and snow clearing was the next one on the list. Right. Um, but the bias, it is hard to, to pull it a hundred percent out this close on the heels of that first election. Right. Um, so, um, we've got a lot of things happening in Turner Valley on paper, but a lot of physical things happening in black Diamond that are actually moving ahead right so so there's this disconnect of well you're lining up for the future and so you're approving things on paper here that necessarily aren't coming to fruition for various reasons but you know you feel great as a counselor saying well we approved a housing development and so on and so forth in a business district and but nothing is moved whereas in black diamond it is like boom time everyone wants in and yeah you're approving things but now you're approving things that you know, the neighbors aren't happy with. And so now you have to have more public engagement. And now we have, uh, you know, petition coming. So, you know, you say, well, this side is quiet. That side's more vocal. And that easily switches from six month period to six month period. But, but that's just being an elected official. You have to deal with you're at AG foods and you get confronted. That's it. Uh, so, a good example of how you can have this division um, and it's good and bad. Uh, so I was up at Rome and I, I say hi to everybody. And the guy goes, Oh, uh, you look familiar. So we chat for a bit and he goes, mm, aren't you the mayor? And I said, yeah, I'm the mayor. And he goes, ah, I hated you for three years. <laughs> <laughs> but I can see now that you're, you're not so bad. Okay. This is good. I'm like, well, that's great to know, you know, like, uh, but that was a Turner Valley resident. Right. And so he was, he was just basing it off of his, uh, his own backyard and he wasn't happy with what he was getting at the time in Turner Valley. And he just brought that forward. And he said, well, I like this diamond Valley to me, this is better. So he looked at everything through a new lens. Now that we had a new election, a new council and a new energy. Um, so it was nice to hear him actually say, yeah, I hated you, but now that I've met you, you're not so bad. And he really was talking about how he was appreciating Diamond Valley and how we were moving forward and not dragging our knuckles in the past. Um, so, so it's been good. Um, but the key in on a few of those, um, uh, priorities that, uh, Brendan was talking about in, in terms of the RV and the land use bylaws and alignment, uh, you know, we're really leaning on our or by law enforcement to do the job that sets the tone that we are one because the rules are the same now for everyone. Uh, so you're not getting special treatment because, you know, you live on such and such a street and those driveways are only this big and so on. It's everybody's on the same carpet and the rules apply evenly to everyone. Um, so our snow clearing was one of those things that, you know, Everyone has a different policy. So Black Diamond had a policy. Turner Valley had a very aggressive snow clearing policy. And so part of the election process when we were going through there was, you know, it'll be great to get the snow clearing all at the one level. And so we've increased that service. And that's been a great win for the community. So we, we just went through the first year Brennan was elected. Massive snowstorm. It was a major issue. Um, you know, and Brennan was out there shoveling like, hey, let's do it. You know, and that that that's just being part of the community. You're going to win votes. You're out shoveling, um, you know. And so so those little tiny low hanging fruits that we can check off a simple policy adjustment like snow clearing, throw a budgetary amount to it. But for the residents, that service is absolutely a win win. So we're looking to find as many of those small low hanging fruits. The uh, sidewalks in Black Diamond, for example are always cleared by public works in the business districts, downtown, the whole nine yards. Whereas in Black Diamond, nope, you hire your own landscaping company and you do it yourself. Okay, so now there's another one we have to deal with. Um, Mill rates 
and utility rates. So okay. mill rates, uh, when we adjusted, um, Black Diamond residents had to take a hit uh, because they were 7.6, we'll just say, and we were 7.7. So, so you had to come up to 7.7. .7, so everyone took a $200 tax increase just based on legislative principles right. that one community must have one mill rate. Yeah. So we were like, ooh, this is not so good. Sorry. But then we flipped to this year and now we're looking at utility rates and getting to zero based um, for uh, water and sewer. Well, Black Diamond was already charging at an efficient level, probably 80% capture Whereas Turner Valley was only down about 60. So now Turner Valley has got to take a major hit to get back up and even. So, so it's a potato potato, um, but those things impact residents. So we're not going to have some happy people when they find out, oh yeah, the utility rates are going up. Stop that on top of inflation and housing and rent and food and GST and carbon, carbon tax, tax. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I think I'll just file my taxes and say I live in St. John's because I identify as a new fee. <laughs> right? So not there touching you that with a 10 I'm foot pole, man. Carbon tax. <laughs> I identify as a new fee. Sorry. I, I'm not paying. Um, so. I, I, so it seems like, and, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like this council has really pulled together over the last year. They have started to work together as a united front to make the community one. But I want to talk about the flip side here, because you have two distinct communities now as one community and the residents, I can imagine there are still some people who think of themselves as Black Diamond, Turner Valley residents, but they are Diamond Valley residents. You have organizations that are Black Diamond organizations, Turner Valley organizations. They're coming together and making one organization as well. Have you seen from the community level buy into the amalgamation process when it comes to organizations working together, whether it be a Black Diamond Turner Valley organization coming together and saying, let's let's pool our resources together. So that way, when we go talk to uh, council and ask for $100 or $1,000 for a project or an event that's coming up in our community, we can actually look at doing it as a community instead of, okay, everyone's going to have to go to the old Turner Valley or everyone's going to have to go to Black Diamond to attend the event. Are you seeing buy-in from residents when it comes to the uh, community spirit that is Diamond Valley, or are you still seeing that sort of dragging them along by rope and hoping that they're going to come to the trough to feed to become Diamond Valley? Who wants to take that? I can start us off and then I'll throw it over to Mayor Crane. Um, I think what's what's been really unique having lived in uh, Diamond Valley now for the last um, She's been going up on eight years here. One of the really unique things about our two communities uh, prior to becoming Diamond Valley was, was a lot of these things were already going on prior to the amalgamation. There was such an, one of the, like, I'll give you an example, like Canada Day, or we have a story, not, it's a Diamond Valley Day Parade, which is the first weekend in June. And, you know, you show up as a, as a newcomer to town, you go do the parade, which was just down the street from our house in Black Diamond in front of AG Foods. And, uh, and, then they, and then it's widely advertised that you go over to Memorial Park in Turner Valley, and then there's this big party after, right, for the kids. Of the, you got a big market there. There's the blow-up castles. So a lot of that stuff, to be honest with you, Chris, that was already taking place. Um, I think... Uh, like another example, we, we just had the Ian Tyson Memorial concert, the first one in, and this was hosted uh, in the old Black Diamond. Uh, but you get the Chamber of Commerce, and these people are from both communities. These are volunteers. Um, you know, Councillor Gordon, many of the councillors from both sides of the river. Uh, that's kind of how I identify at this point. How <laughs> you say both sides of the river? Uh, yeah. But they they volunteered right, and you had volunteers from from both communities at that at that concert. Whether it was um, like Black Sheep Coffee was there selling stuff. Black Sheep Coffee was traditionally in Turner Valley. Come on over, right? So you get the Chamber of Commerce. They did a great job at that Ian Tyson Memorial. That was an awesome one. Uh, we had the car show held by Chris Chalice. Um, traditionally a Black Diamond event, uh, hosted again in Black in Black Diamond. Um, but advertised in both communities, had members and cars from both communities. I think 256 cars arrived. It was the biggest car show that 
that either community has had. Um, so those types of things, um, you've got the Leo Lions. Um, you've got, there's, there's tons of organizations that have been working together for such a long time already. I don't ever, I never found that there was like an us versus them or like, you know, you joke around people, oh, Black Diamond's better. Oh, Turner Valley's better than this. You know, like, oh, we got a brewery. Oh yeah, well, we got a distillery. Like you never found that. I think it'd be a little different maybe if we were physically a little bit further apart, but because geographically we're so close, like if someone was bragging up the Eau Claire distillery, I'd be like, I'll be there in five minutes. You know, like it's not like I have to drive all the way to Oak Toast to go and enjoy it. Uh, I think that the community, the residents, the businesses, everybody relies on each other. COVID, and I don't want to talk too much about COVID, COVID was a huge example of businesses coming together in both communities. The residents supported so many of our local businesses to make it through that tough time. Businesses like Westwood, um, our pizza shops on both sides of the river. Um, and Facebook adds a lending hand to that because we have rant and rave pages. We have business pages and residents on both sides are blowing these businesses up all the time. Oh man, have you tried the pizza over at Maplewood or, Oh man, have you guys been to two foot or uh, foothills pizza? It's incredible. And so there's always, I think, been that part of unity in the Diamond Valley DNA. And uh, this is just an opportunity. Like my, my daughter's seven. She still calls Black Diamond, Black Diamond, um, my, whereas my son is four. And so he hears me saying Diamond Valley a lot more in the house. So I think that this, I think from the, the nature, it's going to be like a generational thing. I think it's going to take a generation of kids to grow up in the new community to start to start actually calling it Diamond Valley. It's not that people are, oh yeah, Diamond Valley, what a, what a, that name sucks. Like I'm just going to call it Turner Valley because that's where I live. I don't hear a lot of that. I know that people tease about it, but to be honest, I think it's just going to be a generational thing where it's going to take my kids growing up, going to school. Like we have businesses that before the amalgamation were already called Diamond Valley. Like we've, there, there are multiple Diamond Valley businesses in both communities. Uh, and that was long before uh, the amalgamation. So yeah, I'll, I'll pass it over to Barry if he has yeah. anything that, to mention. Yeah, the name Diamond Valley has been uh, used on business uh, advertising for about 20 years. So there was Diamond Valley Disposals, Diamond Valley... Um, I think there's a drywall. There's Diamond Valley Drywall. There's Diamond Valley uh, Arts, Arts and Something Something. Uh, I think there's, there's a Diamond multiple. Valley Medical Center or a dentistry because when I was there at the Di Diamond, Big Black Diamond, Diamond yeah, in front Dental. of City Hall is right across the you know, street. Yeah. So there's a whole plethora of Diamond Valley businesses. Um, but just to key in on, you know, how the volunteerism has really, and to me, it's always been about the volunteerism of the communities because we are so close knit, uh, even our fundraising, all of our fundraising is done in tandem and has been for years. Um, but our search and rescue, our Lions Club, our Leo's Club, the Legion, of course, is a great binder of all communities. The hospital is a common denominator that can't be stressed. The fact that we have amazing doctors, like we have, I'm going to say, the best doctors in Alberta live in our town. And we're like, shh. Don't tell anybody, right? Um, but our businesses and our fundraisers, they, they all bind. So when one event is going, um, and just recently, uh, and Brendan and his wife Carly are great advocates for this newest initiative uh, mm. of ladies that uh, have come out, and it's the Diamond Valley Youth Foundation. Is that right, Brendan? Yeah, and it, it, that's the foundation they're hosting the Fall Fling. That's right, on uh, November yeah. 4th. And they, they're a group of moms who got together and they said, we need to fundraise for our PTA, so our parent teacher associations for our two junior elementary schools. Uh, so they just took it up a notch and they've been absolutely like hitting it out of the ballpark mm -hmm. with fundraising. And now they've got this concert organized at Flair and Derrick here in Turner Valley side. Um, but, it, but it serves as the new Diamond Valley. And so they've been attending uh, public workshops and setting up tents at all of our events all year round uh, Diamond Valley Youth Foundation and really putting the PR out there so that is really you know I would say they are the first true group um, that has taken the Diamond Valley brand 
and just hammered it and said, no, we're setting the tone for new Diamond Valley. Here's the new energy. And we're starting right here at the PTA level so that the kids are all in this together. And Brendan's totally right. It's going to take that generation that graduates from oil fields high school that says, Oh, where, where do you graduate? And when they answer Diamond Valley, that's when you know that it seemed itself together. Well, it goes back to the old uh, Saddle Dome, right? Because it's now technically called the Scotiabank Arena, but it's actually like everyone knows it as Saddle Dome. So it does take that generational mm-hmm. challenge. I am cautious mm-hmm. of time here, and I want to talk about one sure. topic that often gets overlooked when we talk about municipalities, and that's the administrative side of this whole amalgamation. Now, your organizations went through a pretty uh, – seismic shift of merging two organizations into one that means people may have had to go look for other jobs may have had to be replaced or uh, as you've said you're looking for a new CAO after the last one uh, resigned and left for another community how have you seen this administration go over and above over the last year to make this amalgamation work not just from a council perspective but from a town perspective as well. And I'm going to start with uh, Mayor Crane on this one because I think he he needs to take the lead as the spokesperson for the community. But then I want to talk to uh, Deputy Mayor Kelly as well about this. So Mayor Crane, in your opinion, how has your staff, your administration uh, team done over the last year in your opinion? Well, I think I'd put it this way. If you had a herd of animals going off to slaughter... <laughs> and you know that you're in the slaughterhouse, you're really not so happy to go through the gates. But in this case, you know, amalgamation was the real thing. We all knew there would have to be some sacrifices. But the reality on the ground is we still need all the bodies. So as much as on paper you want to say you can reduce this duplication and this duplication and this duplication, that's removing bodies from your service level. Um, so we did end up losing bodies, no doubt about it. Uh, but it's also come to light that we really need uh, to have that professional side. So what's happened is we've, we've gone from small town thinking to a bit bigger of an organizational thinking. So we have a new fire chief, we have a new finance um, manager, we have a new planner. planner, new town planner. And they they all came in. They're all excited. And they all said, well, I've been here X amount of months. And you know, my first evaluation is we're understaffed. We need more help. So, you know, to have the fresh eyes come in, do their own assessment. Now, you hired them with the full out, like, you're the man, you're the woman you're going to do this job. And every one of them says we're understaffed. Then you really have to sit back as an elected official and say, well, now how much do I really know about the organization? Because there's running a town and then there's budgeting a town. Of course, we're always trying to keep the dollars tight for the taxpayer. But at some point you have to say, well, what's that service level and what's it cost? Because we're clearly getting the message that we need more help. Now, if we're going to grow as a a community, which was all part of amalgamation, is to plan for that long-term growth, which we know is coming, because we're one of the last towns that are in line for a boom, and now the ring road's done, we've got water capacity, Uh, we're probably one of the only towns in all of southern Alberta that never hit water restrictions this year. But people were still conservative of their water because they were listening to the news, but in actual fact, we were in 100% 100% good to go state because of our infrastructure for water. Sewer, different story, but um, but the reality is we're planning for the next 10, 15, 20 years, and that's all part of amalgamation. So we have great staff coming on board, and they're all saying we need more help. So now we have to deal with that on the council level. Um, but I think for the staff that we have that took us through the first year of amalgamation, um, absolutely stellar. They stepped up. They did the jobs that they knew. And I think it comes down to the fact that they know that 
um, they represent their community and their professionalism in their careers in their chosen field. It's how they finish their day. They have to sleep at night too. And so do you go to work? Like I, I don't go to work and remain pissed off for too long. I just drop the tools and I say, you know what? I can drywall tomorrow. I'm done. Um, but when you come home and you say, wow, that was a great day's work and you feel like you've accomplished something, then you feel good. And I think all of our staff did the same thing. They said, I can go and I can be miserable and I can know that there might not be the best situation in six months time. Or I can go hang out with my friends that I've been co-workers with for years and we can have a great day still. And we can do lunch and we can do coffee and we can we can execute. And at the end of the day, I'm going to feel good. And if, if that means that I stay in the job or I get cut, so be it. But they finish on their own professionalism. And I think everybody has to take some ownership to say, you know, you did a good job. Um, so great for you. And, and that's how you look at it. So, yeah, that, that to me, I think they've done a stellar job. Yeah, we lost the CAO, went to another community, totally get it. There was reasons there that uh, that had to happen. But we're in the hunt now for a new CAO, and we want the CAO of the future. Um, we want one, unlike what the Alberta munis tell us, the average life of a CAO is two, two and a half years right now for a community. Well, that is not very good considering, you know, uh, what you need in the continuity of a CAO to continue to work for a, a council and a community. You want someone who's going to be there. Um, so that's what we're looking for. We want a new leader who can come in, bring continuity and stay the course for a new community that's going to boom and thrive and really put a stamp on it to say, I was part of that. I was part of that amalgamated community, Diamond Valley. In the very first year, I came on board and look at us now, 15, 20 years later. So. I, I'm going to interject before I throw it over to Deputy Mayor Kelly here, but that's a tall order. That's a massive yeah. tall order because it's coming in as a new CAO to a community in itself is a unique entity. I've gone through municipalities who have seen new CEOs come in and there's some somewhat of a culture shock for some because they're so sort of ingrained in the way that the organization does things. But for Diamond Valley, this is a unique beast because this is fresh. This is literally a fresh community where you can make a staple. So when you're looking for a new CAO, and I, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong here, all members of council are on the CAO selection committee because they all get to interview. So I, this might be a, a question for Deputy Mayor Kelly here. But when you're looking for a new CAO that is going to lead this organization, the amalgamations of two communities into one into the future, maybe for four or five years, 10 years, 20 years, what's the key thing you're looking for? Are you looking for someone who's going to come in with fresh ideas or sort of steer the ship steady for a bit and then start making their own impacts on the community? Because I do have lots of CEOs listening to this from Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Trust me, I know, because for some reason they reach out to me on a regular basis. So hypothetically, pitch Diamond Valley to them right now. <laughs> okay, well, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I'll do my best. And and uh, this was part of part of the responsibility I took on when I went when we went to AB Muni's as well was to was to really start to reach out and and see because part part of the responsibility obviously the CAO is the person that works in between administration and council. Uh, so the relationship is very unique. You're taking direction from council, uh, but then you have to administer that to your staff. And and how do you do that? So I'm going to touch on a couple of different things here. The first one I think is one of the more important. Uh, things is that this is a really unique opportunity for whoever comes into this position. Uh, we are looking at um, a, a newly rebranded town, if you will. We have two towns. Uh, we've just we we finalized our logo in the spring. Um, that's that's out there. Uh, our website's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Our strategic plan has been finalized. Um, there's a lot of opportunity here for whoever comes in. Uh, to put their own personal stamp alongside council and administration. And with that being said, um, we're looking for a leader. We're looking for someone that can help with management, uh, someone that comes from an experienced background, whether that be at a municipal level or maybe that it, it could be provincial level. However, I don't think it's unique just to that. I think that there's opportunities as well 
if you work at a corporate level, uh, you know, managing X amount of employees, you've been doing this role for 10, 15 plus years, and maybe you're looking for something new. Um, so leadership, leadership for us has been one of the big things. Uh, we're looking for someone to help guide and, and give assistance to uh, our managers. Again, Mayor Crane just mentioned all this, new planner, new fire chief, new finance, and soon coming is a new CAO. So you, you're not only uh, in, in one sense, you know, you've maybe been playing a sport for a really long time and you've grown up with the kids that you're playing with or the coach has always been the same. This is a really unique situation where you've essentially, this is an expansion team right now. You've drafted these people from all over the place. So you're going to have to have a, a unique set of skills in, in respects to diverse backgrounds, uh, past experience backgrounds, uh, we have a few very um, respected and professional people that are still uh, with our administration. Um, Verna Staples, I can't say enough good things about her. She's our legislative services, and she has kept the ship up the whole time. And, and there are many other staff members that are doing the same thing. Uh, Mayor Crane spoke about that. People are putting in countless hours. These are not nine to five day shifts. Um, especially on the heels of, uh, you know, an upcoming agenda or a committee of the whole meeting or a bylaw review or a utility rate review. These people are working a lot of hours and uh, they, we, you know, we try as a council to commend them for that. However, obviously when they come in with a new bylaw or they come in with something like the RV, it seems like we can be over critical because we're trying to get, we're, we're trying to move things aside. But what they see is the administration side. They see the, the black and white, the previous bylaws, look, I have to blend these two things together. And then they come and sit in front of council and it's like, oh, well, did you think about this? Did you think about that? Why is this this way? Why is that? So it's it's unfortunate at times, um, especially when you don't have a CAO there to kind of, in one sense, protect you from that, where um, you might have council members directing questions to directly to administration when you know, we should be looking towards our CAO a little bit more so that he or she can navigate those questions and those conversations. Because there's times where you finish a meeting and it's like, holy cow, Brennan, like, wow, like, you know, that was, uh, that was a lot of, you know, that was, that was pretty heavy, you know, and, you know, these people are coming off the backs of 10, 12 hour work days, and then they come and sit before us and it can be challenging. So that was one of the things that I really wanted to speak to at, at the AB Munis was, you know, how can we make sure as a council, that we that we're working alongside our CAO, but then can also support our administration. And Mayor Crane touched on that. Even though we went through all the cuts, because we did we did cut multiple departments, um, some of those positions are going to have to be brought back. Like our staff are our staff are tired, and uh, we're, we hear that. Although it may not be um, it may not be heard from the administration side because we haven't been able to do very much. We don't have we don't have a full time CAO right now. So I, I think just to kind of wrap it up is that there's a unique opportunity for the CAO that's coming in. Um, we're, we're, we're putting a lot of resources behind this search. This is not something that's being taken lightly. We're not looking for someone short term. Uh, we would like someone to live in the surrounding area, if not the community itself. I think that there's opportunity there. Um, and I, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a great, great opportunity for whoever is able to um, pick themselves up and, and get over here and, and lend us a hand. We're ready to support them. And uh, we'll be looking forward to having a good conversation with whoever we hire. You get to live here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. right, next to, right next to that. Okay. That's how good it is. Um, it's it's literally that beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll tag on to this one. See, we're going to pitch to Manitoba. There's no ticks. <laughs> no, uh, our, our council, I'll tell you what, our council is extremely, um, it's one of the best councils I think that's ever been put together uh, for our area. And all very unique backgrounds, all very well-educated uh, I'd say all type A's. So, you know, you, you're going to have to blend uh, personalities with professionalism, with code of conduct and execute on direction. What we do want to do and what we have said as a council is we do not want to go down this CAO train ever again. 
if we can help. What we want to do is we want to hold ourselves accountable, accountable as a council uh, along with the CAO and say, look, we want to stay in our lane and we want you to hold us to that lane. Put us on our tracks and don't be scared to say, you know what? You cross the line, get the hell back there, sit down, shut up and do your job and let me do mine. We're totally fine with a little bit of, hey, let's let's stay in our lanes and do the jobs that we're both supposed to do. Um, so I think that's that's really uh, the accountability part for council to not step into the greater, as uh, Ian McCormick would say, who's driving the greater? Yeah, we don't want to be driving the greater. We want to drive the high end automobile of council and we want the CAO to take care of the roadways to make sure she's clear to roll. And that's about it. I mean, it's it's got to be a clear direction setting from both sides. It's got to be respectful. And we've got to just get out of the way and let the jobs do what they're supposed to do. Um, so Access HR is the firm that we hired um, for our uh, search. So you can check that out on LinkedIn. Um, It'll be on the C-A-G-F-O and the A-U-M maybe and all of the lovely acronyms that we have across the country. Um, and I even said, put it in Muni World because people read that as well. So, um, but we would love to see your resume. Uh, at the very least, we have an absolutely gorgeous area down here. We're 25 minutes south of Calgary. Can't get any nicer. Seriously. Check it out. So, so I'm yeah. going to end on this question, and this is my final question, and this is going to go to both of you. And it you you might you might piggyback on the exact same answer, but I think it's an important thing. You are one year into this amalgamation. Was it worth it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Short short answer is yes. I mean, uh, we're we're just. Uh, and I, I won't spend too much time here, but we're just getting into the budget talks and we're going to start to find those efficiencies. They've already started to find some. And I know that we're not, we're not near the end of those efficiencies. It's going to take another year or two before we can really bring all those together. Um, we talked earlier about like community spirit and the relationships between both sides of the river. That's there. That, that, that doesn't need to necessarily be recultured or rebranded or anything. Uh, the communities believe in one another. Um, the flood in 13 was a huge example of that. Turner Valley was fantastic for the residents of Diamond Valley um, or to Black Diamond. Wow, I made that was the first time Yay. I made that. That was the other way. Um, <laughs> the record short answer here, everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the short answer is yes. There's, there's just so many things to look forward to. Um, there's going to be more bumps, 100%. There's going to be more bruises, 100%. Um, but I, I think without a doubt, this is this is a, a major, major accomplishment for both communities. This is a big accomplishment for the province because they don't have to go around telling municipalities to do this because we know that this happens where you have to either absorb another community or one community has to start providing services to another one because they don't have the resources. This was an equal partnership from day one, uh, from council to administration. Yes, there were hiccups, um, but with a new fire chief, with a new planner, with a new finance, with a new CAO, with a new blended council, there will be firm direction setting and we are gonna continue to check things off. We are just at the beginning of these types of events uh, that we've started. And I look forward to continuing being a part of the council, whether it's at my current role as a counselor, as potentially mayor in the future, uh, I'll be around and I, and I really look forward to working with the members of the, both communities, now one community, Diamond Valley. Final word yeah, to you, Mayor Crane, and then we'll uh, let you guys go. Yeah, 100% agree with everything Brendan just said. The deputy mayor is bang on. Uh, one of the things I would add to it, which I've been toting for 10, 11 years I've been on council, is planning for the future. And I, I hate to see it. I, I treat it like a construction job. Um, you know, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. It's too late to, to say, well, we should have insulated the, the bedroom wall when you've got a drywall and paint it. You should have just spent the $50 and put the bats in and you've been done. So same thing goes for infrastructure. We know there's issues. 
deal with them now that you know because it cost us three times as much to tear it up when it's frozen or it's collapsed or broken on the fly right so uh planning for the future to me has always been the goal here and i think amalgamation is the key that leads to that planning um so the 10 to 15 20 years and i always say that is that is where the hard work and the hard decisions that we're going to make in these first few years is going to pay off and the bumps and the bruises that come with it are all part of the ring fight um but you're not going to get to the championship belt unless you get in and practice and you got to win and you got to lose a few fights before you actually get it figured out that okay now i'm ready for the championship game and that comes with time so i think that's where we're leading and that's where we're headed um, so we just got to take the bumps and bruises and take the small victories and uh, play the long game. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Seriously, it's it's an exciting time. And I really look forward to the chance we can look back and say we did a good job. And we're always keeping that hat on uh, of do a good job, and make the best decision we can with the information we have as a council. And we have great debates in our council chamber I got to say, it might be long meetings because I talk too much. That's just part of my personality. But uh, I really encourage a lot of uh, a lot of conversation because I want to say, OK, we had the conversation. Now we're calling the question. So was amalgamation the right thing? My vote is yes. Gents, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing this a year after. Now, I'd say let's do it in a year time, but I think that we'd be having the exact same conversation. So let's say in 10 years time, let's have this exact same conversation and see how 10 years on of Diamond Valley goes. So thank you so much. Well, I think uh, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor of Diamond Valley, <laughs> Mr. Brendan Kelly, at that time, will we'll be more than happy to have that conversation. <laughs> I appreciate I'll be here. that. To our viewers, thank you for tuning in and for being part of this conversation. I want to take a moment and thank Mayor Crane and Deputy Mayor Kelly for sitting down with us today for this special episode of Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest content. From this show, Municipal Affairs, to cross-border interviews, the political trenches, local government at work, and our newest show, The Trustees, that airs on November 19th. We have you covered for all things local government. If you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow and produce more high-quality content like you saw today. A link to our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website is in the show notes. Now, until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.